there we've got uh, Richard Small, previously from Liverpool Dunmore University. <laughs> we now have a lot of work with Reverie's Bible Trust. Uh, he's chair of the Working Group now. Um, and uh, he's going to give us a talk on conservation grazing, delivering habitat management for conservation with native breeds. When I get it up, hang on a minute. Yeah, you, you get it up because what, while uh, Philip is, is getting it up, I'm going to do the commercial break because uh, Philip was too modest, I think, to mention that his, uh, the second edition of his book, for which he's lead author, it came out last year. I happen to be carrying a copy of it around. I'd love to say that I bought it myself and that I could ask him to, to sign it. Uh, it is actually the RBST's copy that, that has been sent to them and I'm supposed to be reviewing it. But it's a very good book uh, and uh, if you'd like to look at it, I'm sure uh, I can leave it there if you don't pinch it um, for a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, Philippe has just said, uh, I retired from Liverpool John Moores University five and a half years ago now, so... Um, it's a bit of a long shot, and if you contacted or tried to contact me there to tell me that my talk's a load of rubbish or whatever, uh, you wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't even remember that I was there. So um, <laughs> if you do want to contact me, that's my email address there. Uh, and I do thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this celebration of Andrew's uh, very wide interests, his diversity of interests. Uh, You've heard already that Andrew was on the, um, or heavily involved with the Rare Breed Survival Trust. He was on what was then called the Council, now the board of RBST for many years, and that's where I first met him. Um, and from the outset, the Rare Breeds, one of the arguments of the Rare Breeds movement for keeping Rare Breeds was that there would be new uses for them, things we couldn't yet conceive of, some new use might uh, occur down the line for which we would have wanted these breeds if we didn't keep them. Uh, to be honest, I don't think there have been that many uses, uh, new uses. Of course, many of these breeds have their role either um, in sort of a, a commercial sense or certainly within a niche element within the commercial field. Um, Libby mentioned Gloucester cattle earlier on, you know, with double Gloucester cheese and so on. Uh, so a, a niche element there. But in terms of new uses, there aren't so many. Um, but perhaps conservation grazing is the nearest we've got to a new use. So it's about that that I, I want to talk. There were some early examples of conservation grazing, uh, right back in the 1960s, belted Galloway cattle were being used um, uh, on Woodwarton Fen National Nature Reserve, and Soe sheep were being used on Aston Rowan National Nature Reserve. But more recently, breeds have become, uh, or conservation grazing has become much more widespread and well known. Um, Back then, it was just the way in which those particular site managers managed their reserves. So, in 1997, seems a long time ago now, I organised a conference which was called <coughs> then, um, my comfort blanket this is, so I'm going to read out this, uh, Use of Grazing Animals in Habitat Management for Conservation. A workshop I organised at Liverpool John Moores University, which tried to begin this idea of associating what were then rare breeds and native breeds more widely with this idea of managing habitats for conservation. And out of that meeting, although it would have happened anyway, came the Grazing Animals Project. Now, some of you I know have heard about that, some haven't, but it, it's an organisation that was set up then to promote the use of native breeds uh, in site management for conservation. So grazing animals 
doing the work on nature reserves. Um, that organisation, the Grazing Animals Project, has gone through various iterations over the years. Uh, it was initially led and funded by what was then English Nature and then Natural England. Uh, but other organisations have contributed to it um, and have led it at different stages or funded it at different stages. Uh, the National Trust got involved. Um, even the Defence Estates, the Ministry of Defence, the Defence Estates uh, were part funders at one time. But in its current form, it's down to the Rare Breed Survival Trust to keep it going. And I'm very grateful to RBSC for, for doing that uh, and realising that this is a use for which we can put some of these rare and native breeds. Uh, so that's what I want to do. Um, but I tell you all this because many years later, tw nearly 20 years later, I acquired a full set of the RBST's magazine, The Ark. Um, you know, being that way inclined. So I went right back to the beginning and I started thumbing through these old um, copies of the Ark and came across a letter which Andrew had penned in 1975 uh, to the Ark. In, in those days, the Ark carried letters and it was a monthly uh, publication. So there was quite a lively uh, exchange of views. And he described how his Hebridean sheep, which were then called St. Hilda sheep, there's some Hebrideans up there, or St. St. Hilda, uh, how he described how his sheep um, had cleared up an overgrown orchard, uh, cleared it of thistles, milk thistles, elder, brambles, and nettles. Now, admittedly, he was coming at it more perhaps from the point of view of, po of pasture management than nature conservation. But nonetheless, it was the beginning of this idea that an animals could be used in this way, and particularly what were then rare breeds. And that letter stimulated a letter in the following art, the next month, from Soe Breeder saying, yeah, Soe's could do that too. Uh, so it's the beginning of this idea I'll quote from Andrew's letter. Um, again, I have to read it out. He said, I feel that the performance of these sheep under these conditions shows considerable useful possibilities for this breed in odd patches of rough ground. Now, all right, as I say, it's more about pasture management, but we've taken that idea and extended it then to using animals in nature conservation and its management. So perhaps we ought to first, uh, before I give some examples of breeds which may have benefited from this use, just talk a little bit about um, why animals are used in this role. Why do we use them in conservation grazing? I'm sure you realise that most of the habitats that conservationists uh, in the UK uh, appreciate and try to manage for their conservation value are not natural. We don't have that luxury in this country of having vast tracts of natural wilderness type areas. Nearly all of our land has been managed over the years. We can talk about a few mountain tops and a few coastal uh, areas perhaps, but by and large they've been created by and managed by human activity and in turn by their grazing animals. So we can talk about lowland, heathland and upland moor or upland heathland. We can talk about various types of grassland, including short grassland, limestone grassland, and even sort of pasture woodlands have had the influence of grazing animals in their management or, or in their creation. Uh, then there's a, a special habitat, of course, a species-rich hay meadow, which has come about partly through grazing, but largely as a way of conserving forage for grazing animals during the winter. So without the, the grazing animals, we wouldn't have any need for hay meadows. And uh, you know, again, it's a habitat that now many of us appreciate. And we end up with beautiful views like that, at least I hope you, you find it beautiful. Uh, so, 
Grazing animals are important then in creating these habitats. And in the UK, most of the management of these habitats now is some way of trying to keep it at a particular stage in the succession. Because as you're also aware, I'm sure, if we don't manage the habitats in some way, then there will be the process of succession and coarse grasses perhaps initially and then scrub, uh, you know, woody shrubs would come in and then eventually some sort of trees. And if you go through the entire succession, you might end up with, or you would end up with some sort of woodland, whether it would be the climax woodland that we were originally uh, blessed with in this country is now doubtful because of the other changes, but nonetheless, there would be a movement towards woodland. So in conservation circles, there's a choice. Woodlands have their place, we, you know, they have their own biodiversity, their valuable habitat, but we don't want everywhere to be woodland, so we need some kind of management designed either to stop the succession at some particular stage that we've deemed uh, appropriate or that uh, desirable, or if it's gone too far, some kind of restoration management which will bring it back to our desired state. Now, just before I put up the next slide, I'm going to have to own up. I've been caught out because probably the person who may have taken the next few photographs or at least has put them together in a grazing animals project training uh, course is sitting in the... Uh, in the <laughs> so thank you, Ruth. Uh, you're not acknowledged on there. You can tell me during or after the talk whether they are actually your photos, but I know you put them together in the particular sequence that you're going to see them now because to achieve that kind of, of management, we can use various things. We can try cutting, uh, I'll list them, we can try burning, and we can try grazing. Now, cutting, uh, all right, I know that tractor is just topping a pasture, but it serves the purpose. It either requires huge amounts of effort, usually by volunteers, and volunteer, even volunteers in conservation circles get fed up with cutting scrub on Heathland after a few years of doing it because they'll have to go on doing it year after year after year. Or we use big uh, and expensive bits of kit like this, uh, which many conservation organisations might struggle to um, afford, as well as paying the driver for it. It may also not be appropriate or, uh, on some habitats like sand dunes, where cutting like this will destroy a lot of the interest. The topography of sand dunes will be lost very quickly if we start using machinery like this. Uh, and similarly, then, there can be steep and rocky terrain um, where we might not be able to use safely uh, such techniques. So cutting might have its place, but the other problem is that it ends up as a very uniform and structureless environment, at least for a while. Obviously, the vegetation will regrow after a while, but here's an area that's been cut, and you can see it's pretty boring. And I used to say to my students, imagine if you were a spider trying to build a web, where in the middle of that photograph would you manage to do that? So cutting may have its place, and certainly, of course, in hay meadows, it's part of the, of the annual cycle. But it's not without its problems. Burning, we use it in the uplands quite a lot um, to manage moors, uh, to where, the, uh, habit, where the dwarf shrubs are fire tolerant and where there aren't so many people around to complain. But it's more difficult in the lowlands where people complain about the smoke and the smuts on their washing and the asthma. I mean, I'm sorry, that's, that's not funny, that's serious. But, you know, there are real issues about using burning in, in the lowlands, as well as the fact that uh, in the lowlands we tend to perhaps have reptiles on our lowland heaths or uh, particular invertebrates which would suffer from the effects of burning and maybe plants as well. And, and that's the other problem with both burning and cutting is that they're so sudden. There's a, a sudden change in the structure and biomass of the vegetation to the point where uh, many 
species may be adversely affected. Now, in contrast, of course, you know what I'm going to say. Grazing is wonderful. Uh, it's able to, uh, and it's become, for the problems, because of the problems uh, of the other two techniques, it, grazing has become the preferred technique on many nature reserves. Can't be used everywhere. Sometimes, uh, well, depending on the grazing animal, uh, archaeological features may be damaged. If you use you know, heavy cattle on an archaeological site, they will be damaged. So you, know, you might have to select which breed you use on that basis. Uh, and sometimes it's not possible to use them maybe in urban fringe situations where the animal's welfare may be at risk through dogs or vandals or whatever. But where it's possible, grazing is often the preferred means of managing habitat then to prevent succession. And although really you've got the uh, advantages of it by saying, well, everything that burning and cutting does, grazing doesn't, it's not quite that simple, but um, we can sort of list the advantages of, of grazing. You've got the idea that it's a more gradual process. So organisms that are mobile organisms at least have the opportunity to move out of the way and escape, if you like, uh, whereas with fire or cutting, they might be killed. Many plants are either grazing tolerant or have adaptations that prevent grazing so they are able to survive and we end up with a mosaic of a lot of plant species. I should say that this all applies if the grazing density, stocking rate if you like, grazing density, whatever you want to call it, is not too high. Obviously you can graze things into oblivion, uh, oblivion if you try hard enough or if you have too many animals. But as long as we get the stocking density right, then these things apply. So we've got a gradual process. We've got plants that can, can tolerate or uh, avoid grazing. Uh, grazing can create a varied structure. So lots of tussocks here. Cattle grazing particularly is good for that. Equines and sheep less so, but good for nesting birds, ground nesting birds and invertebrates, some invertebrates at least. Uh, generally, again, they can be trampled by, by heavy cattle, but we can often retain features like the ant hill that you can see in the sort of uh, mid-right there. Uh, this is laziest flavus, the, the yellow meadow ant, which is a, an indicator of lack of ploughing. Um, you know, that they're, they're an indicator of undisturbed habitats, undisturbed in terms of cultivation, but likely to be retained under grazing. Uh, and grazing animals can create new habitats and new food sources. Some bare ground might be created. That can be good for some invertebrates that like to bask in sunshine, you know, little mark. Uh, microclimates or plants that need open ground to germinate. Uh, dung, of course, is an important food source for invertebrates and hence for birds and small mammals. So grazing is wonderful. It has uh, lots of advantages. Now the impact of grazing, this is just an example of what might happen, you have to take my word for it, that all of this site that you can see, except the, the, dominant shrub, or the taller shrubs in, in the background, but both sides of the fence were cleared at the same time, two years before this photograph was taken, and the fence was put in. On the left, it's been grazed. On the right, it hasn't been, and it clearly, the, mainly willow, but other shrubs ha, have come back strongly on the right-hand side where there's been no browsing or grazing. Um, and again, it might be an important habitat. It might be useful in that form. But if you want the grassland area, uh, then the grazing has achieved that. You can see 
some of the tree stumps here of the trees which were cut down at the time and they haven't well they have reshooted but those shoots have been eaten off so we, we can create an open habitat like this um actually i'll just go back so i hope i've established very quickly that grazing is an important conservation management tool now and i want to go back on to then the subject of the animals which have been used uh, for this purpose and some breeds have become better associated with conservation grazing than others um, dexter has been mentioned frequently today but i'm not going to talk about dexter beyond this but belted galloway cattle uh, are widely used Exmoor ponies are widely used, Hebridean sheep are widely used, and recently Bagot goats have de or are developing a role. So I want to look at those four uh, breeds and just look in very simplistic terms. This is a typical ecologist compared to the uh, geneticist who came before. I can't even be bothered to calculate effective population size. I'm just going to take the data straight off the DEFRA website usually um, <coughs> and uh, just show you numbers of females because that, that suits me. Um, very simplistic approach to it all. But let's look at uh, registrations of belted Galloway cattle. These are female registrations, I should say, over the period 2000 to 2016. And uh, apart from a sudden dip in 2009, you can see that there's been a pretty steady increase over that period and there are now um, many more registrations of belted Galloway cattle than there were 16 years ago or so. So in simplistic terms I'm not saying all, I can't say all of this is down to conservation grazing clearly not but there has what in this context, I think what conservation grazing does, it, it puts a bottom in the market in, in agricultural terms, all right? When belted Galloway breeders take their animals to market, somebody wants to buy them. Now, they, if they've got nice cattle, they might be going into commercial herds or even into showing herds, but if they're less good, they might still be effective grazers on nature reserve sites. So, there's that bottom in the market. There's some value in the animals other than direct to slaughter. So maybe that encourages breeders then to try to maintain these, this breed anyway. Now I'll talk a little bit more about Hebridean sheep. Tom mentioned earlier on that I keep these, so I declare an interest. Um, but this graph shows then the number of registrations and the number of flocks of um, Hebridean sheep between the period 1974 and 2016. The blue line uh, is the uh, number of registrations and the red line is the number of flocks. And I would say in this case that the registrations are both males and females. Again, in my simplistic way, I've just lumped them all together and uh, we just take the total number of animals registered in any year. But clearly, again, you can see that there has been a significant, well, sorry, I shouldn't use significant, uh, uh, a noticeable increase in the number of both flocks of Hebridean sheep and the number of uh, animals being registered. Now, not all of that's down to conservation grazing. Again, I can't say how much of it is due to conservation grazing. But Hebrideans are probably the most widely used breed in conservation grazing schemes. Um, I must say that the, he the Hebridean Sheep Society uh, deserves a good mention here. Um, it has been an effective, uh, active, and for a breed society, generally well-behaved breed society, um, and it's encouraged the breeders of Hebridean sheep to be excited by their breeds and to promote their use. But the society itself, Hebridean Sheep Society, has also promoted this particular use of Hebridean sheep. And it's partly that then which 
uh, again, has helped this increase. And again, it comes down to, in this case, maybe it provides a market for the sheep which are not going to do well in the show ring, but nonetheless are perfectly adequate sheep for the point of view of grazing. And just to try to demonstrate, I mean, it, it's not convincing, um, I'm sure, but... Uh, Oh, just before I do that, this just shows the distribution of flocks of Hebridean sheep in 2010. So going back a while. And the point I just want to make there is they're all over the country pretty well. And I think as the number of flocks has gone up, that distribution is probably more even now than it was then. But it, it's not a breed. Uh, Libby spoke about geographic concentration earlier on. The name Hebridean, or saying, yeah, particularly Hebridean, might give the impression that it's restricted to Hebridean islands, but it's not. It's throughout the country. It's very widespread now. And that's, you know, a part of the safety mechanism, if you like, uh, that would save it from disease outbreaks and so on. But I wanted to also just try to illustrate uh, how well the Hebridean sheep have done in contrast to a similar breed in terms of their size, history, uh, physiology as far as I know, and so on. The, the Max Lockton sheep, similar, they're probably uh, getting into dangerous areas here, but Manx and Hebrideans are probably subpopulations of the wider breeds that were throughout, maybe throughout the UK, but certainly throughout Scotland at one time. And Different groups have been isolated in different areas, and in, on the Isle of Man, they, they focused on a particular colour, the, 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 the Moric colour, um, and so it became separated as a breed from Hebridean, which, as you've seen, are largely black. But the point here is that the breeds are very similar, except that the Manx Lockton has not been promoted for conservation grazing. And, again, I can't say how much of the difference is down to conservation grazing, but the Hebrideans have taken off a bit of a decline in the last few years, it must be said, uh, whereas the Manx have sort of bumped along at somewhere between 350 and 500 registrations a year, and yet they are perfectly capable of doing the conservation grazing job. They just haven't been promoted for it. Uh, Bagot goats um, are a recent addition to the conservation grazing um, group of breeds, really, so it's a, perhaps a bit too early to be predicting that it's having a positive influence. Uh, it's largely down to this organisation, browsingbagots.co, whose photograph I've nicked, um, that they are now being used. Bagot goats are not a commercial breed. They never have been. Previously, they, they graced various parks, you know, around stately homes like Levens Hall in Cumbria and so on. But they're not big, they're not particularly, they're not milky uh, in the sense that you wouldn't want to, to be milking them as a commercial breed. So they've got no real use, but they look pretty. Uh, but maybe there was a future use, so people have bothered to keep them. And now they're beginning to be used in conservation grazing. And that... That might be why numbers of registrations are beginning to go up, but too early to say, probably, uh, you know, it, it could go back the other way as quickly. But provided that they carry on doing a good job, uh, then I think Bagots have got um, a, a future role in conservation grazing. However, Conservation grazing is not a panacea for breed conservation. Uh, the equine breed most widely used in uh, conservation grazing is the Exmoor Pony, and you can see that the uh, number of registrations here, female registrations, is now going down uh, for some of the reasons that have been explored in earlier talks. But uh, in this case, it's... One of the advantages of using equines in conservation grazing is also one of the problems, and that is that these ponies are, have got great longevity. 
So you can buy a, a young Exmoor pony and you've got a grazer for 25, 30 years perhaps. And consequently, once uh, a certain level of uh, demand has been met, it may be that there is no future, you know, there would be a long time before there is more demand from conservation grazing schemes. Obviously, they're, they're bigger than sheep, so you need fewer of them as well. And they're less efficient, they're not ruminants, so that they tend to eat much more proportional to their size than do cattle. So you, fewer of them are needed to manage the same area of land. So it's not solving the problem for every rare or native breed uh, by any means. Sorry? Yeah, that's it. Did you hear what Ruth said? She, she suggested it would be fine if we ate them. And that's true. And certainly for, for Dartmoor ponies, there's now a group you can, that are marketing Dartmoor pony meat. So it may be the way to go. But, yeah, you know, that's part of the... I mean, what Ruth is really saying is that's part of the issue for, uh, for all the equines is because if we don't eat them, there's less demand for them. Um, you saw this slide came up on Tim's uh, display, but it was much smaller and tucked away in a corner. Uh, so I'm glad someone else has picked up on it too. Andrew sent me this photograph. Um, what I wanted to, to say by way of finishing off is that uh, I think, as I said, you know, the letter that he sent back in 1975 suggested that uh, Andrew was anticipating this use of some rare and native breeds. And I think he would have been pleased to see that um, the breeds are being used. And Tim also had a photograph of them, uh, his, uh, Andrew's, um, so a sheep on uphill sea cliffs, triple SI, uh, which I knew I'd seen that photograph somewhere, but it was in a farm animal genetic resources um, annual, re but not annual report, 10 yearly report. Uh, so I couldn't access that. So I was very pleased to see that. So I think Andrew would have liked the fact that these breeds are being used in this way. Um, and I think the other thing that I hope he would have liked about what I've had to say here is that as you've seen, I hope, some of these graphs are based on data and again, Libby made much better use of it than I have, uh, produced by DEFRA's um, breed inventory, or that's where the data have come from. And Andrew was on the Farm <coughs> Animal Genetic Resources Committee when that breed inventory was being set up. He didn't, well, he, uh, he saw, he wasn't on the committee when it reached its fulfillment, uh, but he was certainly part of the committee which pushed for it and got the whole thing going. Uh, so I think I'll probably finish on that. Um, yeah, I think that will probably do for me. But I hope that Andrew would have appreciated these uses for these breeds. <laughs>